so far, uh, we try to model a discrete time process. So by discrete, uh, what I mean is it has frequency, like quarterly, monthly, or daily, right? Uh, but what if we divide that time period into very small interval? So that's the idea of this continuous time uh, process. And here, what we see here is uh, this is the stock price, let's say today. Okay. And I want to simulate uh, what would be the stock price 21 days from now? 21 days from now. So from here to there. Okay. So this is stock price, and this is one particular uh, possible path, and this is another. Okay. So there could be many different uh, ways to get there. Uh, uh, in this case, as you can see, to, uh, to, to simulate this continuous time process, uh, this is where we started, uh, 54.93. And we need some information about what is the volatility of this series. So this is the one parameter. And uh, this is the risk-free rate. Um, and, of course, number of days we need to specify. And also we need this uh, age parameter, which is set to this value. Uh, that is, uh, the, the, what would be the, um, <coughs> this number will tell you that how many times we will slice this time horizon. Right? Well, to understand uh, what's going on here uh, is to understand uh, continuous time process. So uh, in this uh, example, uh, we use some specification in this form. Um, and this is a uh, quite general uh, representation of what you see from there uh, as a risk neutral process. Uh, but in this case, usually uh, when we use notation D, that's the derivative, right? Uh, we, can, we can define this uh, derivative in many different domains. But here, uh, we define this one in terms of continuous time domain. So we call it a stochastic differential, not just a regular differential, okay? stochastic differential. Um, but the, the time interval in this differential is you know, infinitesimally small. Okay? So that infinitesimally small time span is represented by this one, dt, okay? very small. But uh, from, let's say, t minus 1 to t, uh, this, is, this could be considered as a uh, rate of drift or growth rate. Okay? This part describes the volatility of this stochastic differential, this part. So in the previous notation, it was sigma, okay, sigma. And in the previous uh, notation, it was r, risk-free rate. And this one uh, also uh, expressed in terms of uh, stochastic differential. This W is what we call a Wiener process. Wiener process. So what makes this one stochastic? Well, even though it is infinitesimally small time span, this is deterministic, right? Because we are moving this way, right? So this is deterministic and some parameter, and some parameter. So the reason why this is stochastic is because this uh, stochastic uh, differential is uh, uh, stochastic. So uh, we'll start with learning more about 
this W first, okay, and then go back to that problem. Okay. So idea is for the time being, let's ignore this part of what that is. Uh, probably some some of you may already know uh, the properties of uh, you know process, but let's talk about how to actually implement this one uh, in, a, in a discrete time uh, uh, horizon because, well, in that case, uh, we learn that uh, later that this DP is in fact a continuous time uh, process, whereas we want to simulate it in a discrete space, so in somehow we need uh, approximation. Okay. So we'll approximate uh, this process to make it operational in a discrete time space. So first thing is uh, if our time, discrete time interval is defined from, defined over uh, zero to cap T, we divide this uh, interval by some small number. Okay. So this is where you are and this is uh, where you were, but the distance is assumed to be very, very small, okay? Um, so your, your time from zero to cap T is divided into you know, small, small, small inter interval where uh, a T sub i, a particular T sub i is simply where we started and then how far from, from it and then that's the increment, okay? So this is uh, one way to uh, uh, generate this one where this is in terms of continuous time but it is approximated as some discrete difference uh, although the interval is very small. And then this one, uh, stochastic differential here, dw, is simply the location of w at this time period subtracted by the location of w in the previous period. So um, without knowing much about W, but you know, conceptually approximate this small quantity as U sub I. And then uh, this is where you started, say stock price at T sub I. And then uh, this is the uh, small increment, DT. Okay. Uh, this is some norm function. And this is also some known function. And then this one enters right there. So if we know, well, this is something we can define relatively easy, right? Point zero, 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 0.00001, some small number, right? It's easy part. Um, in some application, in a previous application, this whole part, it was simply a risk-free rate like uh, uh, interest rate paid on in a five-year uh, uh, government bond. And this is the volatility, sigma. And if we know what this is, and if we can draw effectively from some distribution, this U sub i, then known number, known number, you know where we started. So you can recursively calculate this one. This interval in the previous example was a pretty much less than a day. So if daily interval is about this, here this interval is very much smaller, much shorter period, okay? Uh, so what I did in the previous example was this one. So let's focus on what this is.
Okay. Um, so our starting point, well, this is actually uh, the way we had it, but we start from here. Uh, the Wiener process, or the different name, standard Brownian motion, is a stochastic process, so denoted by W. Okay. And this is a location. And location is defined uh, between 0 and 1. Okay. 0 and 1. Unit interval. So location so it is defined over this interval. Okay. What is the starting point? Starting point is 0. And then it will move right there, OK? So the, the, the first thing is to recognize it start from 0. And then at the end of the period, it will reach some value, right? It has a property that Ws, S is a later day than T, right? So if you, if you calculate the difference between these two, so here is time T. Here is time S. And of course, this is value of T, this at value at S, right? So difference is obviously this one, right? Difference. Because it's stochastic, we don't know whether this, this difference is going to be big or small, right? It's random, right? But when we say Wiener process, this difference, we, we see that the difference will be distributed normal with the mean 0. And the variance is simply the distance, time distance. So that's the second property of the you know, process. So in this case, in this particular realization I illustrated, the difference is positive, right? This value is positive. But you have the idea that uh, what we mean by this one. Okay. Now this time, it was positive. If we, if we draw other time path, then it might be the other way around, right? negative. Could be 0. It could be big positive, big negative. But on average, this distance is 0. So we said, on average, uh, this is 0. Then what is the dispersion around that value? Well, that is determined by this time difference. So this is the variance. variance. So if you are comparing this value and that value, the difference, of course, there is more chance that uh, the, the difference between these two could be away from 0 has to increase, right? So it could go this way, right? right? It could go this way. So uh, the, the variance depends upon on the time uh, between two periods. And WT is continuous uh, for realization. Um, so that means there is no jump, jump. Okay. Next value, jumping to this, there is no jump. Okay. This is continuous. OK. Then you can s see that this is actually where we are headed. Uh, it says, 
difference between these two values on average zero. On average zero. Right? And the variance between these two is time difference. Time difference. Right? So in our notation H, time difference right? is this small number H. So here is what we're trying to get at. Um, D of W is this, and let's say that magnitude is U sub I. If we assume W is a Beano process, we know that expected value of, of this is zero. And the variance is, of course, time difference, which is h in our notation, right? Well, then, how do we draw this one? We need to draw from some distribution, right? And so we, we know loosely what this is, which is this one, right? When this distance is very close. So as long as we know the distribution of this one, we might be able to simulate this one. Right? According to this property, it says it is distributed normal. Right? So if we, we can be confident about this pro, uh, property, then you know, we, are, we are done. Actually, uh, this is very simple. Uh, distribution, so we can uh, draw numbers easily. Okay, now then, how do we draw this property? Uh, here is the argument. Uh, suppose that we have some a of t. It could be epsilon t. Uh, normally distributed with the mean zero and the variance. And suppose there are uh, the sample size is cap T. And then probably you heard of a thing called CLT, uh, Central Limit Theorem, uh, which is about the distribution of sample mean, which is defined as, well, uh, cap T sum of A of T divided by sample size. This is uh, the sam uh, sample average. And the subscript T means we have cap T number of observations. Okay. Uh, central limit theorem states that sample mean of something multiplied by square T, which is sample size, will have a limiting distribution in the limit. So when sample size cap T increases, what is the distribution of this one? Scaled by square root of T. It will be centered around zero. Right? You see? You are drawing cap T numbers of observation from normal distribution. Okay? So if this is normal distribution, right? So you draw from distribution cap T number of observation and calculate sample mean and draw cap T number again and then calculate this one. We do that many times and see if what is the distribution of this guy. Okay. Well, because underlying distribution has mean zero and, and that was the variance, we expect that sample average could be in a particular realization, it could be some positive, some small negative, right? But it says, according to this, this will converge to zero, which is true parameter. And the variance is sigma squared. Okay. So actually, if we bring this one to there, uh, then usually uh, uh, 
as t increases, actually this value converts to true value this one. Okay. That's consistency. But, but this is the, uh, uh, the result we borrow from, from uh, central limit theorem. Well, the, the reason why central limit theorem is very strong uh, in statistics is sometimes we don't know where this came from. We don't know this. Okay. But if you have unknown distribution and draw numbers and calculate mean and do it many times, draw distribution, then that will have distribution. So without knowing any distribution or assumption, you can still stop from somewhere, right? So that's the uh, power of central limit theorem. And the proof is usually just half page long proof. OK. So we borrow this one. And now let's, let's construct here x cap t of r. Uh, the notation looks awful, but it's very simple scheme. First, um, the R is a location. So we have observation cap T of them, and we try to map it, these numbers, into this interval. So that's the first thing we're we we doing. Uh, because R is bounded between these two numbers. So this is fraction, right? Fraction. The cap T is sample size. So if cap T, oh sorry, R is, R happen to be one, one times cap T is just simply adding everything and calculating average, right? But it, this, the, this symbol, square bracket, is doing this. Um, if R is, let's say, 0 0.101, then um, what this thing says is if we, if we have, let's say, 100 number of observations, cap T is, so in this case, 100, so the value is going to be 10.1, uh, right? 10.1. And this symbol will return you the floor. So get rid of this one. So instead of 10.1, 10, 10 this is 10. Right? If it happened to be 0 0.11, then 0 0.11 multiplied by 100 is 11, right? So 11. But notice that from this number to that number, there are small intervals, right? So if it increased from 0 0.101, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, well, as R increased that, uh, in, uh, in that fashion, still you are adding number 10, right? And then when it reached to uh, 9 and then 11, right? Point in, one, one, then it change, right? So let's, uh, uh, using 100 uh, observations, now we are creating this sequence, starting from R0 to 1. Okay. So this is one particular example when cap T is assumed to be 50. So assuming this one is 50, and as you can see, uh, there is a kind of steps, right? Steps. If we increase this number, cap T, from 50 to 100, this is what you see. If you increase that to, let's say, 400, this look more like this one. More like this one. Okay. So 
So let's learn a little bit more about this quantity. So this is the result. Actually, you can calculate the variance of this one scaled by number of uh, square root of sample size. And actually, uh, this operates into this way. And, and if you're not familiar with uh, 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 this calculation, it's OK still. Uh, uh, it has a variance in this way. So uh, if we apply our central limit theorem, uh, this one, this quantity, is in, in somehow it's, it's, it's average, right? It's averaging it, right? We're averaging something. And central limit theorem says this one has variance this way. So approaching mean zero, and then uh, the variance is r sigma squared. Or uh, if we just a second. I think I, my, my notation is a little screwed up here. Just a second. Mm. What I tried to do here was to bring this term to the left hand side. Okay. Um, suppose x is standard normal. Then why is, what is the uh, distribution of this one? We scale that by some number, sigma. Okay. Uh, then what is expected value? Because expected value is 0, right? So it's going to be 0, right? What is the variance of this? The sigma squared and the variance, which is 1, right? So sigma squared. Uh, so, if you want to go back from here to there again, suppose you want to remove this sigma. Well, in fact, it cancels out, right? This way, right? So that's uh, basically what I did. So I want to get rid of this one. Uh, So by bringing this term in this way, I should left it with small r, right? small r. So this is typo. Right? That has to be 0 and r. This one, yeah. Um, if we do the similar uh, calculation, um, so taking the difference between x cap t at this point in time and in s, this difference scaled by sigma, uh, 
than it was R previously, right? But this time, this is the difference. And then here is another, another mathematics. The concept of weak convergence. And if we, if we increase cap T to infinity, and basically this quantity converges to what we call Wiener process. And mapping something defined in discrete time to something continuous, uh, uh, we, we use a uh, thing called uh, functional uh, central limit theorem. So this is very complicated statis statistics and mathematics. So we, don't, we are not going to worry about it. But this is basically converging to uh, what we're trying to learn which is Wiener process, then let's compare, well, if this quantity is in fact that, okay, then take a look at what is this? What is this? Well, I've shown you how this looked like, right? In the previous slide, I've shown, you know, some stepwise uh, curve, and then as cap T increases, it's more like continuous, right? So you've seen that, right? You can divide that x cap t r path by some constant number. Also, you can multiply that by some constant number. But in that case, whole shape won't be changing, right? The shape will be exactly the same except some scale factor. Right? So as I said, as cap t increases, scale this one weakly converge to being a process. So in a previous slide with cap T uh, getting bigger and bigger, actually you have, you've, you've been seeing this one, right? But here, um, the scaled XT, scaled XT has what? This one. Uh, and, of course, the linkage between this term and this distribution is from central limit theorem, right? Central limit theorem. So central limit theorem establishes this uh, distribution. And we link this one to that using functional central limit theorem. So what is the distribution of this one? What is this guy? This guy is something distributed normal with the mean zero and the variance R. Variance R. So now we know you start from here, okay? Here is R. What is the value at location R? Well, we don't know, right? We don't know. Because the, the thing that makes this W is coming from here, but there we see that, you know, those independent numbers, right? A of T. So it's a random, right? This is a random. So we don't know how it evolves. But what, what do we know is that the location of this one at, at this time is, is on average zero, so on average here, where we started, right? But the variance is R, right? So compare that with here W of S, so left of this. So as this number increases, the variance increases, right? That's natural because you know, as you go to, to that direction, more of uncertainty, right? more of uncertainty. So uh, on average, this is the path. 
but the variance, because of the variance increases as time goes by. So the location could be, could end up with this or the other way around. And this particular realization that is normally distributed the mean zero and the variance are. So this guy normally distributed with mean and the variance S. Right? How about this difference? So W R W S that is distributed it with mean zero variance and the quantity is normal. So that's all we know about Beano process. So this is the thing you remember. Okay. Uh, if r equals to 1, if r is 1, then adding up to there, right? Um, so that in case of this is r, this is 1, right? And it has normal distribution with the mean 0 and 1, right? So w of 1, so location of w at, at time 1 is simply standard normal variate. So this is 0. This is plus 2, minus 2. It will lie, in most cases, there, right? 95%. So it's that quantity, right? So the way... Um, we generate, let's say, stock price. Uh, well, it, this representation is known as geometric Brownian motion, uh, which is the uh, starting point uh, well-known formula uh, uh, derived by uh, Black and Scholes to price option. Uh, in pricing option, call or put, uh, Black and Scholes assume that underlying stock price follows geometric Brownian motion. Uh, but here, well, usually, you know, the reason why we, it is difficult to predict uh, future stock price is we don't know. We don't know expected return, right? Expected return. So if you are actually interested in uh, stock price in a, in a physical space, user space we, we, we see, then we need to put some different parameter, uh, conventionally, let's say mu, expected return. But usually we don't observe or calculate uh, uh, expected return. But in this case, this one is risk-free rate. Risk-free rate. So in this case, 0.23. 20% interest rate is very high, right? So this is the interest rate we observe during uh, current crisis period, uh, 1997. Uh, end of 1997, we had a current crisis, so interest rate was very high. Uh, you understand why interest rate rises 
that high during crisis. Our bonds, our government bonds are worthless because you know, our government is going default, right? So government bond price falls. And interest rate moved to the opposite direction, right? So that's. Uh, we've seen that uh, in, in, you know, in our uh, previous lecture, uh, the volatility of Korea stock market was about uh, like 20% uh, or less a year. At the time, it's 89%. Very high, right? So in this example, uh, this was the... Uh, uh, I believe that's the uh, COSPI 200 uh, recording that number, and I try to uh, to simulate uh, this stock price from today until uh, next 21 days. Okay. So in this case, uh, usually this this time horizon uh, time is usually expressed in terms of in terms of year, so 21 days is about this fraction. Okay. Um, so that's, uh, that's my horizon. And then uh, this is uh, basically uh, uh, the, the small interval, I, I'm assuming. And this sample code, uh, known as Euler uh, Maruyama uh, approach, is to, I can show you just this part. Um, looks very complicated, but, but this is where we uh, generate these numbers. Um, first, uh, Suppose you have stock price uh, uh, in a previous period, in a small time interval, previous period. Suppose you have that, and then this H is our DT, small time interval, okay? Small time interval. And What was, what was A? Oh. What was A? This one. Um, this A function, this A function is right there. Okay. So this is previous stock price. Previous stock price. It enters as P. So P times R. P times R is returned. And then this B function, when you receive stock price, that times sigma. Uh, uh, sorry, sorry, that, that price. That is returned. And then this U, what is U? U is um, random normal variable. I draw from random uh, standard normal something from standard normal. And then I multiply that, that by square root of h. I multiply that by square root of h. So this is my approximation for dw. So let's see whether that's the case. Well, a DW was W T uh, I plus one minus W T sub I, right? Small interval. This small interval, H was T I plus one T sub I. So this is small interval, it's dt, right? 
So this difference is dW. We know what this quantity is. It has mean zero and the variance is time difference, right? Which is H. So how do we draw number from here? Well, you draw a number from standard normal first and then scale that by this one. So if you calculate variance of this is H. So, for convenience, I try to uh, draw two series, two series, um, so code look awful, but basically uh, it's calculating this one recursively. So ds was that, r times s. That was our a function. And this, oh, sorry, we missed here s. I missed this one. This one. Sorry that I have. Uh, many uh, typos in my lecture material. Uh, I thought I, I corrected this one, but still it's there. Okay. So what I did here actually is <coughs> right function some error, okay, that receives initial value, initial stock price. And then A function that define this part. B function find, uh, that defines sigma S. And H is small interval, this guy or this guy. And number observation, um, because I am looking at 21 days, right? But I'm mapping this one into something smaller one. So I'm, because the, when I set this number to some very small number, some very small number, that means I'm dividing this one into very small intervals. So when I calculated, uh, it was about 50, uh, 574. Okay. So I, I, I calculate that number. Uh, actually, where is an obvious? This is an uh, excellent work of my uh, textbook editor. So when I, when I gave this uh, file to my text editor, uh, uh, the publisher, they edited in this way. Of course, uh, I don't know why. A tau was meant to be 21 divided by 365. So she removed this slash. I don't know why. Uh, H is correct. So what is number observation? Well, this tau, 21 over 365, divided by h, this one, to calculate how many. So that turns out to be 574. So this was also her souvenir, my editor. Okay. So, uh, 
So this is number observation calculated in that way. Tau divided by H. Uh, and then number of series, or let's say two sequence, three sequence. Okay. <clears throat> So when I actually run that program, that's the one you saw here. Okay. So let's play with it. You know, let's see what it can do. Okay, here is an application. We start from the assumption, stock price. Uh, uh, in, in this discussion, uh, we introduce two different measures or space. One where uh, you cast a dice and the probability of seeing one, value one, is one sixth, right? The probability of observing two is also one sixth. Right? That's we, we call that physical measure. Right? Physical measure. What is uh, objective measure? Well, objective measure is something different, uh, and that's the whole issue uh, when you learn uh, stochastic calculus. Okay, so. Uh, for the time being, let's think about there is some different probability space. So uh, rolling dice, dice may not, uh, and observing number one from that space, but the probability may not be one sixth. Could be different. Okay. So let's not worry about. Um, this is defined in physical space where stock grows in a continuous fashion at this expected return, mu. And this is volatility. And here is a the valuation suggested by Cox and Ross uh, in pricing option. It says, well, what is the um, uh, less value of core option? Now, when the core option expires at time cap t, okay. So, this is t, this is cap t. Okay. So current stock price is here. We don't know where it ended up, but it will certainly end up some, somewhere, right? It says, this is what we call exercise price, or strike price. So exercise price could be here. So core option is right to buy this stock at that price at maturity. I can buy this stock at this price at cap T. Okay. What if actual stock ended up higher? Well, then I can buy that stock at this price and immediately sell it at this price, right? So this is the value I get, right? Right to buy and sell it. If I observe this, unfortunately, this is a loss, right? So in that case, I wouldn't exercise my option. I'll just forget about it, right? So there is an opportunity and you know, down, there is no downside. But that kind of product or option, what has to be the price of that kind of right to buy at small t? That's
that's the option pricing, right? That's the pricing. According to Cox and Ross, well, if you know cap T, the value of S at cap T, this is known number, S small t. Uh, if this is positive, then a max of that is this number. Right? Uh, if it happened to be smaller than x, then this is the max. So calculate this max, and then take expectation. What is expectation? We collect all likely things, sum it over, and divide that by number of observation. Right? That's average, expected value. Right? But this value, if this is positive, this will happen at time cap t, right? Cap t. So you have to discount it back to where you started, right? Because trading of this core option occurs at small t. So discounting this one all the way back to there is the first term. So this is time difference in terms of annual. So in our previous example, this is, let's say, 21 divided by 365. Okay. And then discounting back, right, in a continuous time fashion. But this number, R, is not that one. Okay. Stock grows. And it will earn or sometimes lose. So we think about expected return on stock. And that could be mu, right? But we don't observe this mu. We don't observe this mu. What do we observe? We observe risk-free rate. Okay. So because we know that number, we want to apply this small r. But this one appears looks risky, right? This one looks risky. Um, something that is risky, this risky outcome, cannot be discounted back with risk free rate, right? That's not matching. Right? So this is the clue. This is, the this is not stock price at cap T. This is a stock price from this process. We are converting the space from this physical measure, physical space, to something called risk neutral space. Where by risk neutral, what we mean is uh, there is no risk. Risk is irrelevant. If we, if we can find some relatively, uh, 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 if we can generate S and, and that in new school process, but still there is uncertainty, right? Certain uncertainty. But in this risk neutral process, S grow at this rate R, which is risk risk free rate. Okay. And then this whole thing is about without knowing true S cap T. If you know something, you can tell something about S cap T star, like this one, then calculate this one. Uh, Simulate this one many times, and then take the average, and then discount it back with known value r. So that's the uh, beauty of uh, risk-neutral valuation. So uh, asset pricing course in finance is about how do we change things from here to there, okay. and then rest if this is the case. Uh, then you know we can easily simulate this situation. 
So what we, what we do here is, because this one and that one, only thing different is this one. Same sigma, right? Same sigma. So we can observe this one from historical data, the volatility. We can observe this one. Right? Structure is the same. Right? So calculate, draw this thing, add up, add up, add up, and the next value, and so on. Right? So at the end of the period, which is at cap T, maturity date, in a, in a, in a, let's say, jth simulation. So we simulate first S star. So J equals to 1. We compare that with this. And compare. Okay? So which one is, is bigger. And store it here. And generate S star. So J now equals 2. And compare. And calculate that max and here. So it could be some positive number or zero, right? Positive number or zero. So let's say, let's do it J, let's make it J, say 100, 300, 500. Okay. Then what is the expected value? Expected value? Well, expected value is, of course, you know, adding all those and then uh, if you simulate this one, 300, then J, cap J is 300. So average. So you calculate from this uh, calculation that part. And then you know, we know this one, and we know this interval, so we can calculate CT. Okay. So the, uh, the next slide is about calculating this quantity as the, this part. And then dividing that by this one by changing J from, let's say, 3, 4, 5, 100, 10, uh, 200, and so on. So. Uh, of course, the, that risk neutral evaluation. There is closed form formula. That's well known formula for core option. Okay. But if we calculated that, and that theoretical Black Scholes option price, core option price in this case was 5.95, 5, 5 which is this one horizontal line. And as J increases, the value converges. So why do we do all this trouble simulating numbers, J times, and doing this when you, when you know this theoretical price, which appears to be very close? Well, in this case, it may not be, you know, that may not look that, you know, uh, innovative. But when people thought about the pricing problem, of this one long time ago, early 70s or prior to that. Well, it was very difficult mathematics. Still, I think you know, many uh, scholars in business school uh, still don't know how to you know, drive this closed form solution for a core option or put option. Um, but even though we didn't know that, uh, this simple valuation framework with simulation, you can get that. Okay. But still, sometimes uh, the problem is actually uh, 
you know, generating, generating a stock price sequence and then calculate the in intrinsic value and then calculate maximum value and do it j times and then discount it back uh, and basically uh, it's not that you know, complicated problem. But think of doing this, the, the power of this. Suppose um, this x strike price. In this case, it was known, right? Known. Suppose x is not known. It has small t. That, that's possible, right? So suppose x is not known. But, you know, some particular option could be like, if this is the case, maybe, you know, the highest price marked during this period. Well, we don't observe this one now, right? But it's, it's plausible, right? So as time goes by, if you look back, and there could be some peak, right? That could be your x, right? Um, well, without simulation, uh, pricing that kind of option could be very difficult because we don't know this one, right? But when you, when you simulate this uh, S star in a risk neutral space, because you're simulating this number and you observe this, right? So in this case, your intrinsic value is negative. So maximum is zero, right? In other simulation, We observe all the historical data, right? So if you have to write your theoretical model that consider all those possibilities, it will be a very difficult task. But, but in simulation, because we see that, then we might be able to value it. Right? So many of uh, the, um, the valuation model, uh, these days uh, derivatives get uh, more complex and complex. Uh, in that case, this kind of simulation technique could be very powerful and useful. So that's the, uh, uh, the message. Okay, uh, we'll get back to the application where uh, it involves uh, stochastic differential uh, in the later part of this lecture. Uh, but let me pause uh, here uh, for the moment and we'll try to uh, move away from this continuous time process and talk about a little bit of, of other issues, uh, interesting issues in stock market uh, and get back to uh, the application, second application of this continuous time thing, which is this one. Um, let me give you some motivation, uh, and then we get back to this one uh, first next week. Uh, suppose We have a return. This is log return. So this could be monthly return or annual return. Let's say this is annual return. And last year's return and so on. Okay. So this is at t. Uh, so it's, it's actually adding uh, continuous compound return over k period, right? 
So k years. Um, and and then uh, if it is at t, of course, you're looking back this way. And if it's t plus 1, and this is the period, right? So sup using RT sequence, suppose you created uh, RTK sequence. What is the variance of that? Variance of that. Um, the variance of, let's say, single period return is, let's say, sigma squared. Sigma squared. Maybe some constant and sigma squared. What is the value of this one if they are random? Single period turns are random. Well, by random, what I mean is there's no covariance, right? So if, if, if you are adding k number of random return, the variance is, of course, k times sigma squared. So k times sigma squared. So if you scale that by k, then it cancels out, it cancels out. Right? So it has to be 1. So someone did a long time ago. So if it is one, two, three, four and so on. Uh, if return is purely random, then when k is 1, then of course uh, variance of this divided by this divided by 1 is of course 1, right? So it's 1. 2, same. 3, same. So that under the null hypothesis. But when a group of uh, scholars looked at historical annual S&P 500 index and calculated its variance ratio and found this pattern. Small positive and then below. Okay. Well, um, we know, well, we can assume that ST, this is a random walk, right? Random walk. Let's say log stock price, log stock price lagged one period, could be random walk. Alternatively, log stock price could be 7t. And pi being less than 1. Could be close to being one, but less than one. So when you generate autoregressive process like this one, typical pattern of that, uh, this one, is like this. So by observing from historical data this pattern of variance ratio, a group of scholars uh, concluded that stock price is not this, and somehow there is some 
predictable thing going on. Of course, they don't think I, they don't think stock price is following autoregressive process like this. You know, this is not not the case. Uh, they are thinking, well, this could be something, but something else going on, like this. Stock price We've seen this model. You remember this representation? The Fed model, right? Fed model. So log stock price has a fundamental value following random walk and some cycle, which is this, for instance. Okay? If there is no cycle or Fed, It drops out, drops out, so this is the same as that, so stock price is random walk, right? Um, but if the variance of this is not zero, and some number less than one, then, you know, the, the variation of, the personal variation in the stock price could be predictable. So, in somehow, roughly, they've been thinking that kind of thing might be going on. But the leading opinion, before they observed this, was the world of flat variance ratio. So this was the leading opinion. This was the leading opinion. Now they are thinking this. So we'll try to learn about uh, uh, this statistic uh, a little more because we are using sample to calculate variance ratio like this one. And because it's calculated from sample, this is statistic, which is random, right? So we need to see something, we need to talk about uh, distribution of this statistic, or this statistic, or this statistic, under the null hypothesis, which is this. Right. Um, well, since I thought about this problem 30 years ago, uh, I thought this is really the case. But I don't mind accepting actually this is going on. Why? Well, there may be something going on, which is predictable, right? This is predictable part. But if the variation of this one is very close to the variation of S, and if this is very small, then even though it is predictable, they may not be economically significant, right? So that's uh, uh, my current uh, uh, opinion on this, this problem. But at that time, the, the issue was that, well, in somehow stock is predictable. You know, people were amazed, literally amazed. So the whole direction of research is to find, can we predict it better? You know, even beyond that problem, predictable versus unpredictable, beyond that, they are, they are, they are looking, uh, uh, s uh, some, you know, looking ahead the better way of predicting stock price. So we thought that well, that's wrong direction and, and waste of resource, uh, research effort. Uh, so there has been a big debate. So let me introduce that uh, a little bit more in detail when we meet next time. So this is uh, uh, the, the, what I have to say for the day. Any 
questions? Mu? Which mu? This one? Uh, you know, it depends on, you know, if you're looking at the annual stock price as this, uh, then stock may earn some positive return, right? So, so if stocks have been up and down, but in this way, then if you look at some period like this or this, you know, maybe some positive mu, right? Possible, right? Anything else? Okay. Uh, probably this weekend is the last weekend can, you can enjoy, you know, outdoors, like climbing mountains and so on. And after that, we will have very cold uh, winter starting. So hope you enjoy uh, weekend, and I see you all on Monday. Thank you.